Good evening and once again welcome. This lesson is being recorded for Sunday, June the 11th, 2023. And this is the lesson that will be presented when we assemble together here in Bellflower at 6 p.m. in the evening. And as is always the case, if you are in our area, we do invite you to come and be with us as we gather together to worship God every Sunday. We have a Bible study at 9.45. Uh, and also a morning worship service at 10.50 and again at 6 p.m. on Sunday and then a, a Wednesday evening Bible study as well. Uh, before I actually get into the lesson this evening, I want to um, make a very quick announcement and that is the fact that I will not be recording lessons for the next uh, about five weeks. Uh, we are going to have a couple of weeks of vacation out of state, and then following that I have some other commitments uh, that I need to take care of. So as a result of that, it'll be mid-July before we record another lesson. Uh, but in the, And I just want you to know those things as we get into our lesson here for the evening. But let's go ahead and get started with our study for this time here. Um, we have started last year a, a study of a journey through the Bible in which we are examining the 17 time periods of Bible history. Um, and we have actually dealt with three of the different Bible time periods before the flood, as well as the flood and its results. And then we had the scattering of the nations. And the last few lessons we've devoted to the patriarchal age, which is the fourth period, and in particular, we've devoted a handful of lessons to Abraham, uh, who is the first of the, the main characters. Well, with that in mind, today what I want to deal with is I want us to take some time and notice the next character of the three primary patriarchs, and actually the patriarchal age, it, it deals with Genesis chapter 12 through Genesis 50, and it would include Joseph, but the, the three primary patriarchs that are addressed typically together are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And like I said, and then of course you have Joseph, who is the son of Jacob, who delivers them into the land of Egypt. Today I want to talk about Isaac a little bit. Now Isaac is an interesting individual when we deal with these things. He's um, The least amount is said about him of these three individuals. And in reality, Isaac is what I would describe as a transitional character. Now we're going to see in this lesson that there's a that there's a couple of events recorded associated with the life of Isaac. But much of what is said about Isaac is actually related to Abraham and it is related to his son Jacob and the things that are associated with that. But we do have him as this transitional individual and, and, and he was a, an important character where God was concerned. And we're going to see in this lesson today, we're going to talk a little bit about his life and then we're going to look at some lessons that we can glean from his particular life. Now the life of, of Isaac is recorded in Genesis chapters 21 through 35. And as I said, you've got the transition here. The early part of it, you're dealing with his interactions with Abraham. And then the latter part, his interactions with Jacob. And of course, his death is recorded in chapter 35. Now, a couple of brief introductions about Isaac. He was an obedient follower of Yahweh. Uh, and he demonstrated a great faith, a faith that I believe he learned from his father. It's also interesting that he lived for 180 years before he dies and then he is buried. Now, as you look at the character of Isaac, one of the things that becomes prevalent is that he was a more passive individual. And I want you to understand when I say he was passive, it, not that he was cowardly. Um, um, he did what needed to be done, but he was somebody who sought peace. And he was very successful. God was with him. He was blessed with great possessions. There's actually a text in Genesis that records how he, he increased a hundredfold, which shows how blessed he was as an individual in the land where he lived. Uh, furthermore, um, we find uh, that the promise that was made to Abraham is actually repeated to Abraham. 
Isaac. And that's found over in Genesis chapter 26. And, and some of the, the main passages that we're going to be dealing with is we're going to be looking at some events that are associated with Genesis chapters, uh, uh, Genesis chapters 25 and 26. Uh, uh, and some other things along that particular lines. But you find in Genesis 26 and in verse number 3, you have an occasion where there's a famine in the land, and um, the Lord appears to Isaac, and he says to him, and this is verse, verse 2, he says there, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For, you, for to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of the heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws." So you find here a significant passage where the promise that was made to Abraham in Genesis 12 is repeated to Isaac, and it will also be repeated to Jacob. Now another observation to make about the life of Jacob is in the New Testament he is actually mentioned 20 times, or his name is mentioned 20 times in Scripture. And here's a little bit of a breakdown of the New Testament passages where we find him. Three of the times that he's mentioned, and it's actually in two verses, uh, three of the times uh, uh, it's dealing with his lineage, the fact that he was a descendant of Abraham, the fact that he was the father of Jacob. And associated with that, and this is the most that you find uh, his mentioned by name, is he's associated with the three patriarchs. In other words, you hear this description, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's actually, um, that's actually what you find in Genesis chapter 1 and in verse number 2. But, but you turn over, to, um, turn over to Acts chapter 7 and in verse number 32, and this is where Stephen is preaching. This is where Stephen is, is, is preaching to the religious leaders in Jerusalem. It will result in his being stoned to death because he rebukes them. But as he's given an accounting of the history of Israel, he says there in verse number uh, 31, When Moses saw it, he, mar he marveled at his sight, and he drew near to observe the voice of the Lord came to him, saying at the bush, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So you have the Lord Yahweh identifying himself even to Moses as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and that's, uh, you find that seven times in the New Testament. As a matter of fact, if you look at our outline, the seven times that it is mentioned uh, are all recorded there. You have a handful of times where um, uh, as the promised seed, that is Abraham gave birth to Isaac and, and he was the promised seed. That's recorded over in Romans chapter 9 verses 7 and 10 as well as Galatians chapter 4 and in verse number 28. We have another event and this is primarily associated with Abraham. Where in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 and 18, by faith, Abraham offered up his only begotten son, Isaac. So he offers up Isaac as a, uh, willing to offer him as a sacrifice. And, and in James chapter 2, verse 21, you find this same event mentioned as an act of obedient faith. Something that we talked about in the life of Abraham. And then, of course, you have his faith, which is mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, once again, and in verse number 9, you find, uh, speaking of Abraham, by faith he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. So here you've got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob mentioned again, but this is dealing with their faith, their faith in God, and the way that Abraham dwelt in tents, Isaac and Jacob dwelt in tents, and they did not own uh, uh, possession in the land of, uh, of Canaan, per se. And then, of course, in verse 20 of Hebrews chapter 11, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. And of all the events we do have recorded in the life of Isaac, 
That's the one that Hebrews 11 actually mentions, and I'll deal with that in a few minutes. So that's a little bit of a background associated with Isaac. Now what I want to do is I want to just go over his life a little bit and just kind of remind you of the events that are associated with the life of Isaac as recorded beginning in Genesis chapter 21. And some of these we've already mentioned because we've already talked about Abraham. He's born in Genesis chapter 21 to, to Abraham and Sarah. And of course, Abraham was 100 years old. Sarah was 90 years old when Isaac was born. And of course, in the very next chapter, when Isaac was uh, likely a young teenager, uh, that he, the Lord appears to Abraham and says, I want you to offer your son Isaac. Isaac goes with him. And of, of, of interest, as you read through that account, there is no indication of any resistance where Isaac was concerned. So he's associated, obviously, with this sacrifice. And, and, and it's my belief that that's one of the things that will develop his character as a follower of God. Now we read in uh, Genesis chapter 23 that his mother Sarah dies at the age of 127. So uh, uh, Isaac would now be 37 years old and Isaac has not yet married. And remember, he's the son of promise. He hasn't married. And then we find after Sarah dies that, that a couple of years later, Abraham sends his, him, his trusted servant to the land uh, where his relatives lived, uh, namely uh, Laban and his family, the land where they lived. And you find the reason for that, and this is something that I actually want to, uh, uh, I, I want to read concerning this in Genesis chapter 24. Here we find that Abraham, as he sends his servant to find a wife for Isaac, it is by faith that Abraham is sending his servant. He trusts God that his servant will find an appropriate wife for Sarah. And what's interesting is Abraham does not want Isaac to marry any of the Canaanites. You, you read in verse 2 of Genesis 24, it says, Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, Please put your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. Abraham didn't want his son Isaac marrying an idolater. And he was living in a land that was full of idols and those who worshipped false and idolatrous gods. And so Abraham sends his servant uh, to where his relatives are up in the area of Mesopotamia because he wants somebody that believes in Yahweh and follows after Yahweh, and he knows he's going to find that. And, of course, as you read through Genesis 24, his servant goes, and, and, and the result is he finds Rebekah, who is, uh, who is uh, Laban's sister, and... Uh, she comes back with Abraham's servant and marries Isaac. And of course you read in Genesis 25 and verse number 20 that at that time Isaac is 40 years old. And so there we have uh, Isaac marrying Rebekah. Now, we find that for some 20 years... They have no children. As a matter of fact, Rebekah is, is barren for 20 years. And you read there in Genesis chapter 25 concerning this, where it makes the point. Genesis 25 and verse 20. It says, Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, his wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrians, paid in Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea and Re Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And, and what's interesting to note here, remember the difficulty that Sarah had conceiving and, and having, bringing Isaac into the world. It was, it was the hand of God, and the same thing is true with Rebekah. She was barren, so in order for her to have a child means that there was a miracle that was associated with this. And so she conceives, and of course, 
what you begin to read about next is she has trouble in her belly uh, as she is carrying what was she was told would be twins. And of course we know that she's going to be giving birth to Isaac or, or to Jacob and Esau. You actually read concerning her in verse number um, 22. Uh, of Genesis 25, it says, The children struggled together within her, and she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two people shall be separated from your body. One, uh, one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So we find that the struggle is actually addressed to her, and she understands what is going to take place. And of course, following this, we find that uh, Esau and Jacob are born. Esau comes out first, and then Jacob comes out, and as he comes out, he's holding on to the heel of his brother Esau. And of course, that's what we read about them as far as the birth is concerned. The next thing that we read about is in verse number 27 of Genesis chapter 25. You find that that um, uh, they grow, uh, they continue to grow, and you find that as they grew, it says in verse 27 that Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob, Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. So here you have Jacob and Esau, and uh, they go different paths. You also read in verse number 28 of Genesis chapter 25, it says Isaac loved Esau, because he ate of his gain, game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So you find here we're introduced to the favoritism that takes place, and I'll deal with that a little later on as we get into uh, our study and we look at some of the lessons associated with this, because that becomes a problem. But nevertheless, we find Esau, who's this mighty hunter, and, he's a, and uh, Esau, somebody who was impulsive, uh, in his actions, he's uh, uh, more rough, I would say less refined, but nevertheless he loved hunting and he goes out and, and he hunted game and as you've already read there, Isaac loved the wild animals that he would hunt and bring and prepare. But you find that there was an occasion where he, uh, where he uh, is hunting and he's not successful with the hunt and he comes home and and he is, quote-unquote, starving to death, it would be the, the way that we would describe it. And, of course, uh, Jacob has prepared some stew and some bread, and, and it's, it sounds so good to Esau that he's, he's, he's starving to death. And Esau says, I'll give it to you if you'll sell me your birthright. And, uh, of course, Esau impulsively says, you know what, I'm starving to death right now, and, and what good is my birthright going to be if I starve to death and if I die because I don't have any food in me? And so as a result of that, he, he agrees to sell his birthright for a, potted, or a pot of stew. Now, I need to mention something here about Esau. You know, Esau is actually mentioned three times in the New Testament. We'll, we'll deal with Jacob in our next lesson as we address that. But we find that Esau is actually mentioned about three times in the New Testament. And you find here in uh, Romans 12 or 9.13, Jacob I have loved, Esau I have hated. And uh, just the observation to me there is God chose the younger. And uh, you know that would be a good illustration of what we talked about in our last lesson. Uh, on, on Sunday morning when we were dealing with being a disciple and we talked there about how when Jesus said in, in Luke 14 that uh, if anyone comes after me does not hate his father, mother, his siblings, his uh, children, uh, um, he, or his own life, he can't be my disciple. And we pointed out that that expression, hated, actually indicates to love less. And you find that as, as an idea in this text here. God loves Esau. God prospers Esau. But he chose Jacob, which is the point of that. And of course, in Hebrews 11 and verse 20, which a text we've already mentioned there, uh, Jacob blesses, um, uh, or Isaac blesses Jacob and Esau by faith. But then you have Hebrews chapter 12, and in verse number 16, and I, I want to read this real quick here, because we find later on as the Hebrew writer is concerned about the direction that, the, uh, that his audience is headed, 
He talks about how you are to pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord, looking careful lest any of you fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. Esau sold his birthright for a pot of stew, for a bowl, a bowl of stew and some bread. And, and it basically demonstrates how Esau was impulsive and he did not take seriously uh, the things that were most important where his life was concerned. He, he would have lived uh, what you might describe there as a reckless life. As a matter of fact, in verse 34 of Genesis 25, and this is at the conclusion of this, it makes the point there that thus Esau despised his birthright. He did not treat it as valuable as it was because of his impulsive behavior. Well, we go on after this, we find in Genesis chapter 26, Isaac is dwelling in the land and there's a famine. And we find that he moves around, but he moves to the land which would be associated with the Philistines. And of course, Abimelech is a leader in that area. And uh, he basically deceives Abimelech in the same way that Abraham uh, deceived Abimelech in Genesis chapter 20. And this indicates more than likely that the term Abimelech was not just the name of an individual, but it could have been a title associated with a leader in that region. But what happens is Isaac, because of the beauty of Rebekah, as he moves into the land, um, he says that she is his sister. The very same thing that Abraham did with Pharaoh and in, uh, with Abimelech in Genesis chapter 20. And of course, um, um, Isaac is being treated favorable, but then on, on some occasion, Abimelech actually sees Isaac treating Rebekah with endearment. Not treating her like a sister, but treating her like a wife. And as a result of that, Abimelech actually calls for Isaac, and he challenges Isaac and says, surely she's not your sister, she's your wife. And of course, even though Rebecca was a near relative, she was not his sister in, in the term of an actual sibling, but a near relative. And sometimes the terms brothers and sisters were used uh, from the standpoint of, um, of a relative. So you have this other twisted usage of language. But nevertheless, Abimelech, because of this, he gives instructions to all the people to leave Rebecca alone. And basically anybody who touches her, touches her will be put to death. So thankfully he was spared and nothing happened with Rebekah. But nevertheless, we find after this that Isaac continues to prosper. He stays in the land as the Lord told him. And we read a few moments ago in Genesis 26 verses 2 through 6. This is where the Lord repeated the promise to Isaac. And he said, you continue to dwell here. Don't go down to Egypt. But you dwell in the land, and I will take care of you. And, of course, we find there that Isaac believes what the Lord says. And he, uh, um, and, uh, and he goes on, and it makes the point uh, 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 that, that, that he does trust God. Now, as he remains in the land, as you read in Genesis 26, he is very prosperous. And you read about this in Genesis chapter 26, beginning in about verse 12. And of course, one of the things that happens here is, uh, is the, the, the Philistine neighbors are jealous of him because of his prosperity. And basically everywhere that uh, Isaac would go, they would go and cause trouble. They would stop the wells where he is drawing his water so that he can't feed his flocks. And, and as a result of that, Isaac just moves. And the way it seems to be indicated, rather than Isaac taking his individuals and confronting them and challenging them, he just moves on to another location. And this is descriptive of his passive type of an attitude. And he actually does this several times. You find in Genesis chapter uh, 26, verses 24 and 25, as he is doing this, he finally comes to a place that's called Beersheba. Beersheba. 
And it says, The Lord appeared to him at the same night. The same night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear. I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. And he pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. So you find here that, again, as he's moving, there's a degree of discouragement. But the Lord appears to him and builds him up. Says, I want you to know that I'm with you. I'm not going to leave you. I've made a promise to uh, your father. I've made a promise to you, and I'm going to fulfill the promise that I have made. And I, what's interesting here is it says that Isaac built an altar to the Lord. Now, you may recall as we were looking at the life of Abraham, that was consistent with everything that Abraham did. Everywhere he went, one of the first things he would do is build an altar to the Lord because he worshiped Yahweh. And here we find Isaac doing the same thing. And this is this to me is a demonstration of the faith of Isaac. So we read about all of that taking place. And then the next thing we read about is if, in the last part of this chapter, you read there that when Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives, and it mentions there a couple of women of the Canaanites. And it's interesting as it says that they were a grief to Isaac and Rebekah. And of course, uh, again, re remember, uh, Abraham's living in, in the midst of idols in Canaan, and he doesn't want Isaac to marry a Canaanite because of their idolatry. So he marries Rebekah. But they have children, and, and, and um, Esau, who's living in the land, he marries women who are Canaanites, and it becomes a grief to Isaac and Rebekah. They, they, they see the problems associated with this. You know, you may recall in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14, this is where uh, um, Paul said to the brethren there, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. If you're unequally yoked and you put unbelievers as, at an advantage, it is going to cause problems. And that's what we find taking place here with Esau. And I'll talk a little more about that in just a few moments. Well, following this, perhaps one of the more uh, dominant events in the life of Isaac is the deception of Jacob and Rachel. And I don't know exactly how old Isaac is at this time, but it's going to become evident that he's going to live for another two or three decades at least two more decades following this. But for whatever reason, he, he feels like he doesn't have much time left. So, so he calls his son uh, Esau to him, and he, and he basically says, I want you to go find some game. I want you to prepare food for me, and I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you the, the firstborn blessing because Esau was the firstborn. And, of course, Rebekah hears about this, and... Uh, 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 Rebecca hears about this and she uh, uh, tells Jacob to prepare some food and she dresses up his arm. And one of the things we're told is the sight of Isaac is not all this good at this time. So she dresses up his arm so that he's hairy like Esau was. And of course she prepares some, some stew for Jacob to present to his father. And then of course Jacob goes in or uh, yeah, Jacob goes into Isaac with this meal prepared by his mother, and he presents it, and he deceives Jacob, implying that he is, uh, implying that he is, uh, uh, he's actually Esau. Matter of fact, Abraham, uh, uh, Isaac realizes there's something wrong. He actually says it's the voice of Jacob, but it's the the skin of Esau, and Jacob lies to him, says, "I am Esau." But nevertheless, we find that Jacob gives, um, or Isaac gives Jacob the blessing that he intended to give Esau. So he gives him that firstborn blessing. And of course, uh, uh, there's a couple of things that you need to think about as you deal with this. Obviously, we have here a case of clear deception that takes place. But there's a couple of things you need to think about as you look at this. Uh, you may recall that in Genesis chapter 25 and in verse 23, and this is when um, 
when uh, Rebecca had conceived and she knows that there's a problem as the two children are struggling with each other and she's told that the older is going to serve the younger. So you have here a prophecy from God that Jacob was going to rule over Esau and understand that this blessing gave the household authority to the one who was blessed. Secondly, we've also noted that Esau was profane and he despised his birthright as we talked about. And understand that the birthright would have been related to the blessing that was going to take place. The reason you would receive this blessing is because you had the birthright. So in reality, Esau had forfeited his right to the blessing as well as his birthright. And so you need to keep those things in mind. And by the way, that's not a justification of what Jacob and Rebekah did. But it is something to give consideration to. And when you get over to Hebrews chapter 11 and in verse 20, and we read this a little earlier, but let's read it again here. Because it's the verse that describes Isaac in Hebrews chapter 11. And he makes the point there, by faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. This is the, the act of faith of all the things that happen in the life of Isaac. This is the one that's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 concerning his faith. And of course we know what takes place after this is as soon as he finishes blessing Jacob and Jacob leaves, Esau returns from his hunt and has prepared his food and he goes in to Isaac and he says, here's your food, I'm ready for my blessing. And Jacob is trembling he's so upset at what's happened because he knows that he's been deceived by his son Jacob and very likely uh, he very likely he knows that Rachel or, or Rebecca had a part in that and of course Esau is bitter and Esau says give me a blessing also and uh, Isaac blesses Esau but it is a lesser blessing, and he basically says that you're going to serve Isaac. Your descendants are going to serve the descendants of Isaac, and, uh, and you're going to dwell off the fruit of the land. Now, you're going to do okay. You're going to prosper is the promise that is made to Esau from that standpoint, but you're still going to serve him. And, and, and in the end, in the end, you're going to leave. And Jacob is going to be the one who is going to inherit the promise. So that's what you have as far as Jacob and Esau is concerned. And of course, as a result of that, we know that Esau becomes bitter. And he determines that uh, when Isaac passes, he's going to kill Jacob. Remember, you know, he, he doesn't know how, uh, Isaac doesn't know how much time he has left. But he's going to live another several decades, at least two, maybe three more decades before he actually dies. Nevertheless, uh, Esau, thinking that his father is going to die soon, he says, as soon as he goes, I'm, he says, I'm going to take care of Jacob. He's bitter and angry. And, of course, as a result of this, Rebekah comes to uh, uh, Isaac and, and tells him uh, about the threat that has taken place. She knows about it, and as a result of that, Jacob sends, or uh, Isaac sends Jacob away to Laban, uh, the family where Rebekah came from. And of course, what we read about when Jacob arrives there is uh, he ends up marrying Leah and Rachel as well as their concubines. And he actually serves in the land under Laban for some 20 years. And I'll get into that when we get into the life of Jacob a little bit. But that's what you find taking place there. And what's interesting is, as far as Isaac is concerned in the book of Genesis, uh, he kind of drops off the scene. You remember how he said he's kind of a, he, he's a transitional character. We don't read much about him over the course of this next 20 years. The next time we read about him is at his death. And this is after Jacob returns to the land and, of course, uh, we know that Jacob and Esau were reconciled after this 20 years when Jacob finally meets Esau again. And Esau has accepted his fate. And so together they bury Isaac. 
And what's interesting is Isaac is married or is buried in the cave of Machpelah. You read about this over in Genesis 49. He's buried in the same cave where Abraham and Sarah were buried. And his wife, Rachel, is buried there. And that's where he's going to be buried as well. Or his wife, Isaac's wife, Rebecca. I apologize. I keep mixing up Rebecca and Rachel. Rachel will become one of the wives of Jacob. And of course, Rachel will not be buried in the cave of Machpelah. So we find uh, in Genesis 49, this is described here. So that's a little bit about the life of Isaac and what we have recorded in Genesis. Now for the remainder of my time, I want to look at some lessons that we can learn from the life of Isaac. We're just going to briefly go over some of these things and then the lesson will be yours. And the first lesson that comes to my mind is that children learn from their parents. And I think this is an important lesson to give consideration to. You know, you hear the expression, like father, like son. There is so much truth that is associated to that, um, to, to, to that uh, uh, proverb, that saying. But here's a point. Parents have a responsibility to teach their children. And there's a good chance that their children are going to father, follow their parents. In Proverbs 22 and in verse 6, you read there, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Paul, over in the New Testament, in Ephesians chapter 6, and in verse number 4, said, Their fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. There's also another interesting passage in the Old Testament in Psalms. In, in Psalm 127, we read here about children. And there's a point I want to make in this. Text. Let's go ahead and read in verse 1. It says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat bread, uh, eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. Now you notice in verse 3 it makes the point that children are a heritage from the Lord. And also you've got the warning that it's the Lord that needs to build a house. And if the Lord doesn't build a house, they labor in vain who build it. Now what I find interesting in verse 4 is he talks about like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. You know, and what I think about there is uh, an arrow is something that is put into a bow and it is aimed and it is let go of by the archer. Well, in this text here, the archer is the parent and he's aiming the arrow and the direction that the arrow goes is the target that it's going to hit. So parents have a responsibility to direct their children in the direction that they need to go. Now, Here's a point I want you to understand about this. While you can do t all the teaching in the world where your children are concerned, your most effective teaching tool is going to be your example. The example that you set for your children, that's a good likelihood of, of at least part of the direction that they are going to go. And I want you to think about problems in Isaac's household. He set a poor example in some areas. Now, he, had, he was an example of faith, and Jacob had faith in God. He didn't, he didn't worship the idols. He worshiped Yahweh. But you also find in uh, Isaac, you find favoritism. He showed favoritism toward Esau. Rebekah showed favoritism toward Isaac. And uh, we see the problems that resulted from that as we went through his life. You have deceitfulness. Isaac deceived Abimelech. Well, uh, you find Jacob, he's going to be a deceiver. 
He learns from his father. Just uh, he learns from his father, uh, and 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 that deceptive way rolls down to the next generation. It's passed down to the next generation. So I think that's something that we need to give consideration to when we look at the life of Isaac. But another lesson that I would consider is talking about favoritism itself, the dangers that are associated with favoritism and how favoritism is actually wrong. You know, one of the first points that I would make is when we look to God and when we strive to uh, follow the example of God, we need to understand that God shows no favoritism. You know, uh, 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 as Peter is sent to Cornelius, the first Gentile, and as the events are explained to him, he knows what's happening. And, and as he begins to teach Cornelius, he says, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in him every nation who ever believes in him will be saved. Over in Romans chapter 2 and in verse number 11, you find here Paul is describing the judgment scene uh, uh, the judgment of God, and he makes the point, uh, and there is no partiality with him. And I'm going to tell you right now, we should not be, in, we should not show partiality either. <coughs> Excuse me. In James chapter two, you have here a passage where James is dealing with the assembly, and he makes the point there in verse one, my brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus the Lord of glory, with partiality. And he gives this example of, of, of a rich man and a poor man coming into the assembly, and the poor man you set in the back and you give honor to the rich man. And he says, you've shown partiality in doing that. And in verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as, your hell, as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. The warning is there. If you show partiality, you sin. Isaac and Rebekah were both showing partiality. And I'm going to tell you right now, you know, I can't help but wonder how much did favoritism factor into Isaac's family problems? Uh, the relationship that Jacob and Esau had with each other. You know, uh, because of that, you know, and you're going to actually see that more in Jacob because I'm going to tell you right now, Jacob learns from his father how to show favoritism. He shows favoritism to Rachel over Leah. He shows favoritism to Joseph and Benjamin over the rest of his children and the problems that happen. And we'll deal with that when we get to the life of Jacob. But the point is, is we ought not to show favoritism. You know, in Colossians chapter 3 and in verse uh, 21, and, and some see this as a parallel to Ephesians chapter 6, and in verse number 4, which we read a few moments ago, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. You read in Colossians 3 and verse 21, it says there, Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. You know, I can't help but wonder, when parents show undue favoritism, does that discourage a child? You know, when that child is not being shown the love that his siblings are shown, can he not help but think about he is inferior to his siblings? Think of the problems that causes in the lives of people. Now, I realize every child is different, and, and parents have to treat each child differently depending on uh, depending on their disposition and who they are. But that's different from actually just showing favoritism and having a favorite and, and letting everybody else know that this is my favorite child or, or living with that type of a demonstration in your life. We learn from Isaac that there's a danger that is associated with favoritism, and we can see that in his siblings. Another lesson that I learned from uh, the life of Isaac is that God deals with imperfect people. As we've already pointed out here, Isaac, you know, he, he was faithful to God, but he had his faults, as we've been talking about here. And, you know, one of the interesting things is you read through the book of Genesis, that's one of those things that becomes very prevalent very quickly, is that all, all these great examples of faith, 
they had character flaws. But I want you to understand those character flaws did not prevent them from being able to be servants of God. And the same thing is true with us. We may not be perfect, and we're not. We have flaws. We have weaknesses. We have failures. But God still loves us. Romans 3 and verse 23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you read there in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, God demonstrates his own love and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We, as we look at the examples of the Old Testament, it ought to give us hope that even in our weaknesses and our flaws and our failures, we still have hope. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all men everywhere should come to repentance. God wants us to come to him, and he will accept us even with our flaws, provided we're willing to repent and turn to him. I learned that from Isaac. Another lesson I learned from Isaac is that recorded wrongs does not imply approval. And I think this is just something that needs to be said. You know, let's be clear about this. Jacob and Rebekah lied. And in the process, the will of God was accomplished. But I don't want you to think for a moment that that is implying that if it's for the sake of good, that it's okay to lie. Don't live that way. We're told in Ephesians 4 and verse 25 to speak the truth to your neighbor. Revelation 21 and verse 8 says, All liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. Don't ever go around thinking, you know what, as long as it's for a good cause, it's okay for me to lie. As long as it's a good cause, it's okay for me to do a little bit of stealing. Or it's okay for me to, to do this or do that. After all, it, it, good is going to be accomplished. Don't ever think for a moment that accomplishing good is uh, justification to do bad. You know, as the saying goes, two wrongs do not make a right. And neither does one wrong make a right. And you could look at uh, other examples. You could look at the example of, of, of Jacob uh, as he stole his brother's birthright. Yeah, he received the birthright, but... That doesn't justify his actions on that occasion. So there, uh, that's a lesson that we learn. Another lesson we need to learn uh, from this and so many other examples is that actions have consequences. Esau's profane attitude cost him his birthright and his blessing. So this flippant attitude toward more important things. And again, while it was in God's plan, uh, 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 that did not relieve Esau of his complicity in selling his birthright. In other words, even though God had said the older is going to serve the younger, that doesn't mean that Esau was not responsible for his own selling his birthright. Why else in the New Testament would he be described as a profane person because of that? You have Jacob's deceit. Think about when Jacob goes in and deceives, uh, deceives Isaac along with Rebekah. He has to leave to, to, to protect his life because Esau is so angry with him at that time that he has to leave and he's sent away. And he doesn't see his parents for 20 years based on the text. So there's consequences to our actions, and we need to give consideration to that. And we learn that from the life of Jacob. Another lesson we learn from the life of Jacob is you need to be careful who you marry. And as we've already noted, uh, Abraham was concerned about this, where Isaac was concerned. I mean, uh, he did not want Isaac to marry a Canaanite. Uh, uh, think of what happens when, uh, when you marry the ungodly, the examples we have. You know, Solomon with his... 700 wives and 300 concubines, they turned his heart away from God and to their idols. Ahab marries Jezebel, who was, uh, 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 who was a wicked woman. 
and she basically turned the children of Israel or helped to turn the children of Israel to the Baals. And then you, then you have the, the, the flippant behavior of Esau marrying the Canaanite women and how they were a grief to Isaac and Rebekah. And again, I just remind you of 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. You know, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And while I do not believe that passage is specifically uh, dealing with who you marry, I think who you marry is an example of that. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you marry an unbeliever, you're going to have problems with your spiritual father-in-law. And that's something you need to never forget. You know, when a husband and wife are together, you know, you read over there in 1 Peter chapter 3 and in verse number 7, and this is where, you know, Peter is talking about the responsibilities of a husband. And he says, you dwell with your wives with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. The emphasis is that you're heirs together. You together are getting each other to heaven. And that ought to be the goal of a husband and a wife. Over in Proverbs chapter 18 and in verse number 22, you read there, He who finds a wife finds a good thing. He finds favor from the Lord. Or Proverbs 19 and in verse 24, Houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. I think Solomon is there observing, you marry wisely. Your, your soul depends on it. Your livelihood, your, your spiritual uh, grounding as a family depends on who you marry. So be careful who you marry. As an example, you can see it as you look at the life of Isaac and the events associated with him, both who Isaac marries as well as who his sons marry. And another lesson we can learn from Isaac is that you can choose to be a peacemaker. You know, Isaac, he wasn't somebody who went around looking for trouble. As a matter of fact, whenever possible, he would yield. Even though he was in the right, or, or he had a right to be where he was at, he, when he was wrong, you know, he would do his best to not cause trouble. At least that's the descriptions that we have. And I'm going to tell you right now, that accords with what God wants of us. In, in Proverbs, or in Matthew 5 and verse 9, Jesus there in what is described as the Beatitudes said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. God wants us to be peacemakers. Or over in Hebrews 12 and verse 14, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Or Romans 12 and in verse 18, where Paul says, As much as is in you, live peaceably with all men. You do your part to be peaceable. And let God take care of the troublers. We ought to strive to live peaceably. And you find that as an example in the disposition of Isaac. He was one who sought peace with others. And then finally... With Isaac, you learn the importance of trusting and submitting to God's will. You know, overall, when you look at the life of Isaac, he was a man of great faith. He obeyed Yahweh. He trusted God, and he would approach God with his needs. You know, uh, Rebecca was barren. He goes to God and pleads on her behalf. When the Lord tells him to stay in the land of Canaan and don't go to Egypt, he stays in the land of Canaan. When the Lord appears to him as he's dealing with his enemies or, you know, um, his neighbors as they're shutting up his well and driving him around and the Lord comes to him and says, I'm with you, it says he builds an altar to the Lord. He trusted God. And that's why you read in Hebrews 11 and verse 20, the one thing said about him as he blessed Jacob, Jacob and Esau, he did not waver. You know, it's just so interesting to think about, you know, that particular blessing. Jacob did not back down from having, or Isaac did not back down from having blessed Jacob. He kept it in place. 
It's like after it took place, he knew that this was the will of God, and he accepted it. And it went from there. We're told to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. Proverbs 3, verses 4 and 5. And friends, that's the way that we need to be living our lives. So there you find some examples of, and some lessons that we can learn from the life of Isaac. And I hope you can find some benefit in the things that have been said in this lesson, some things to give consideration to. And the point to consider in all of this as we go through these 17 times period is the things that were written before, they were written for our learning. And we can learn from those things. What do you learn from the life of Isaac? Is, is there some things in your life that you need to change? Or is there some things in your life that, you, that give you strength and encouragement as you look at his, at his example? It is my hope that we can learn from him as we can learn from every other example in Scripture. Not only what we ought to be doing, but also what we ought not to be doing. And that as we deal with the Word of God, we will handle it accurately and not put things there that are not intended. You know, such as, as we've talked about in the lessons here uh, about, you know, uh, wrongs don't make a right. So think about all these things. And with that, I commend this lesson to you. So if you would at this time, please bow with me. Our dear God and our Heavenly Father, we always thank you for what we have. We are so thankful that you have given us your word as a guide, instructions as to how to live our lives, but not only instructions, but also just examples. Examples of what is good and examples of what is not as good. Help us with humility as we study your word to live properly, to follow the examples that you would have us to follow, and to learn from the examples that you would have us not to follow in our lives. Help us to learn from all these great examples of faith that you have recorded for us. And may they help us to be lights to those who are around us, and in whatever way that we can to make our communities around us just a little bit better. We pray all this through your son's name, and amen. And again, thank you for listening to this lesson. I hope you find some benefit in the things that have been said here, that you can apply these things to your life uh, in one way or another. And again, I want to remind you that for the next few weeks, um, there will be no pre-recorded lessons. And when I get back from dealing with all of these uh, uh things that I have coming up, I'll, I'll do my best to get the lessons recorded. You know, just understand, even though uh, I'm not going to be here, we're still going to be assembling. We've already made arrangements. The lessons are going to be presented. The classes are going to be taught. And so certainly, um, if you're in the area, come and be with us as we gather together to worship God each Sunday and as we study from his word on Wednesday nights. Thank you for listening. Have a good day. Have a good week, a good rest of your month. And, and Lord willing, uh, in, in just a few weeks, we'll see you again. And until then, take care and, and, and goodbye.